Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Saturday morning at Falkland uh, on a typically wet but excellent day for a festival. Um, don't you all agree? Uh, I certainly, for one, I have no inclination. Even I have no inclination, and I see a few other crofter faces around the room who probably feel as disinclined as I am to go out today. So uh, it's brilliant to see such a, a really good attendance for a Saturday morning session, but I think it probably tells us the level of interest that there is in the topic. And it's been really like that all week. I was here on Wednesday afternoon and um, there was a very, very good attendance then for one of the first sessions and so it's continued. So, um, this morning we have three speakers. We're not talking about a particular book per se. We have three people who from very different perspectives are going to share some of their knowledge gleaned over many years about the topic of the festival. And what we're going to do is we'll hear from each of our three speakers, first of all, and then we three and me will have uh, an opportunity to have a, a bit of a chat together and then we'll open it to the floor and um, we'll, I'm sure that our three speakers will be very, very happy to engage in discussion, to respond to questions from yourselves. Um, so please think about, think about your questions, hang on to them as, uh, as we hear from our three speakers. So without further ado, well, first of all, very, very important, please make sure your phones are off. I forgot to make that important announcement the other day and I heard a bing, 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 bing at one point. I thought, oh my God, it's my fault. So it's not going to be my fault, or at least if I hear a bing, 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 bing now, it won't be my fault. So uh, it can happen so easily and really uh, uh, it's not fair to the speakers to be distracted. So without further ado, can I introduce the first of our speakers this morning? Margaret Bennett, will I am sure not be a stranger to any or most of you, because she has a, a reputation on an international stage as one of our foremost Scottish folklorists. And uh, Margaret has, she's, she's actually, she's a singer, she's a storyteller, she's also renowned in her work as, in, as a researcher in this topic. So uh, it's really brilliant that, that uh, Margaret is here with us today uh, to share some of that with us. Don't know if she's going to sing. I haven't asked her that question actually, but who knows? Who knows where the morning might go? And uh, over to you, Varit. Please welcome her. Thank you very much, Agnes. Thank you for inviting me. I always love to come to Lewis. And thank you all for coming. With all the cups of tea and coffee around, this reminds me of the setting in which I heard most of this. It wasn't in the library, but it was where it counts, by the fireside. Bushnock, witchcraft. People on the highlands, at least, and yes, and well into the lowlands who talk about it, will use the word bushnock, whether they're talking in Gaelic or English. Bushnach. You will hear people without a word of Gaelic, they'll know the word. Bushnach. It hasn't passed my notice, or possibly yours, that today is November the 5th. Well, is that Bonfire Night, or is it Guy Fox? Well, if you ask my mother's generation and yours, they would say, Hut, Guy Fox, Covision. Who was that? And in fact, it only dates to, it's, it's very common all over Scotland now, <clears throat> really only dates to the implementation of the Education Act of 1872, when all teachers hired in Scotland, England, Wales, everywhere, would be teaching based on the English curriculum and in the English language. So the first Halloween bonfire that appeared after the Education Act, the teacher told them, no, it's November the 5th, now that's nonsense. They would go home to the parents and say, Hut, we've got this wrong, the teacher said. 
And so by this generation, it's in. <clears throat> but I still meet people of the older generation who say, no, we didn't celebrate that. So what in the world did they celebrate? Well, there was a celebration on Eichehauna, Halloween. Yes, the dressing up, and yes, the going round, guising, and so on, but also the bonfire. <clears throat> and why was that? Well, in the old Celtic calendar, this November the 1st was the beginning of the new year, the Four Seasons. The other half of the year was Beltane. But it was believed that the whole of the underworld was in turmoil. Fairies, witches, ghosts, they could be about. And if perchance you had some experience of the previous year when somebody who died had a grudge against you, woe oh, betide you if they came back, they had a power to do you some mischief. So people dressed up. If you were afraid of any of the above, you can dress as a goat or just black it. The most common guys was to blacken their skin with cork, since this is the color that people call white. Do the opposite and wear something. You can, men would dress as women and women as men and so on. Anything went. And even in the 50s, I remember Halloween in Mel was very well. I never saw a single witch. But we had great fun. And if you look back another 30 years to the photographs that Margaret Faye Shaw took in U.S., look at these costumes. Halloween. Sheepskins and heaven knows what. But they, held a, they had a bonfire at the end of the, close to midnight, it would be blazing. And that too was to burn away any possible vestige of evil. That still actually survives um, as other fire festivals are come to. And we can thank John Lauren Campbell and Margaret Fayshaw for the collections they did. Um, what, I, what, what I was mentioning to you, you may think is anthropological speculation. How do you know people were afraid of these spirits? Well, John Lauren Campbell made a recording in the 1930s of an old man in Barra. Being an, of a, up in years, he didn't go out for Halloween. No, he sat by the fire, and as the geysers came in, you would try to guess who they were. My mother was good at this. She'd look at your hands. You had to wear boots on your hands, or she'd know who you were. Anyhow, the old man froze in terror as in came the geyser, stamping around the kitchen. And they thought he'd taken a very bad turn. They guessed, and one by one, they took the masks off. And finally, when a young fellow dressed in a sou'wester, Wellingtons, and the raggedy of jumper you ever saw, like an old fisherman, he took, he was the guest, he was 18, took off his mask, and the old fellow nearly fainted. Because that young lad was wearing his grandfather's clothes, his oldest, they found them in the shed, and he was guising with that. What he didn't know was the old man and the grandfather fell out 60 years before and had never spoken since. So he nearly died of fright when he saw him coming through the door of his own house. So that's how we know this actually was the belief. John Lauren Campbell, um, he would have described himself as, and Margaret as folklorists, simply the lore of the folk. He began a foundation called FIS, rather a nice acronym, the Folklore Institute of Scotland. Where is it now? It was in the lead up to the School of Scottish Studies. He gave them all his recordings he had, and when it was founded in 1951, they said, there'll be no folklore here. It's going to be Scottish Studies, and it's never really been used since. So I'm happy to say they, they do refer to me as a folklorist at the Conservatory, where I'm attached now. So I Hachalin, that also picked up the bonfire when we had our new Gregorian calendar and New Year and the Julian calendar. They had a bonfire then too. And it remains to this day in, for example, Burghead in the Broch or little village next to where I live, Comrie, where they go around the boundaries, burning away. Not everybody maybe believes in it. So is this about faith or belief? And I include Perthshire because, as we can see from the statistical accounts of 1791, this was an entirely Gaelic-speaking area, Crief, and the place names will tell you that. And even the following one, um, 
they say Gaelic is spoken here, but the young ones are now speaking English. People in the village today don't think there was a word around. But just along the road in Dunning, there's a memorial that somebody paints every year, and we don't know who paints it, but it's a reminder. She was burned as a witch. Nobody knows why, but she was. So what's it all about? When the Folklore Society began in the 1880s, surprisingly, perhaps, from our point of view, a lot of the new members were ministers. <clears throat> Some people ironically say, is that because they had nothing to do all week except preach on a Sunday? Well, among them was this man here, John Gregerson Campbell. He was an Argyllshire man, went to school in Glasgow, and his first call was to Tyree, also in Argyllshire, where he was the free church minister. And following the guidance of Campbell of Isla some years before, and it's the same guidance that we use to this day, write it down in the words of the people themselves. Don't change anything. Write it down as they told you. And so he did. And within a few years wrote two quite amazing books. The second one, Witchcraft and Second Sight in the Highlands. <clears throat> Despite the fact that he had concluded the first book by saying, superstition shuts out the light, makes the mind unhealthy, and fills it with groundless anxieties. It didn't get published, not until after he was dead. He did, however, publish some of his material with the Folklore Society. But this was a setting for where he gathered those stories, by the fireside, yes, with a kettle, so welcome. And he listened, and he would write them down in a notebook. And he must have asked himself, is this really a question of belief, or is it faith, or is there a difference, or do, is it neither? But I think that when we look at the accounts of other ministers, this is from the statistical account, the sort of dubious, they still believe in the evil eye here, 1854, we then look in the recordings from Highland Perthshire. Oh, I heard of one, the steward of Mingus. Now, here a cattleman wouldn't allow the laird to come into the buyer. His own buyer. He thought that if he came into the buyer and he saw a cow and fancied that beast, something happened to it. And on she goes to talk about witchcraft. But perhaps most audio recordings that are lodged in the School of Scottish Studies come from the island of Tyree. Now, is that because there are more witches in Tyree? I'll let you decide. It's because we had a very, some very great folklorists go to record them. And this man, Donald Sinclair, had a fount of knowledge about every aspect of his island. And here is his voice. My mother was not over at Philippo when she was a young girl, really. Because uh, at that time, the Baptists were keeping horses. Yes. Cattle, cows. Yes. And my father was the, the groom there, my grandfather. Oh, yes. And so I would point out to show what my grandfather said it was. And my mother remembers I had been over at him. Yes. And my mother told me often that the Bunny Moe had a black book. Mm. And any time that anything was stolen, he would look at this black book. I'll quickly tell you what it was. He had a black book of the black art. And any time something went missing, he would put on an iron crown on his head. He would look in the black book and he would tell you who stole it. The Ballymore was the factor, and he was uh, responsible for putting a lot of people off their crofts. The other man was Hector Cameron, and between them they had great discussions. You can look them up there online, so I won't play any more of them. However, the man who recorded him, Crigine was a Manx man and he spoke Scottish Gaelic, but he saw a lot of similarities between the beliefs and the sayings about all of these subjects in the Isle of Man and in the islands. So here's John McInnes. I thought I'd bring his voice, as this is a man who would be known to all of you, undoubtedly one of the, the genius of the 20th century. And here he is recording in Lochaber, and it's very brief, but you'll hear this is about Caramel, who was a witch. <laughs> Do you have a 
So he listens and he and he has many other recordings, including this one about a man in Achaltibui. And I'll just let you hear a tiny bit of it. But you can look them up and they are quite remarkable accounts of what was circulating in these communities at the time. So at the mo- this one was recorded in 1960. But let's well, there are, there are man, you know Well, this man was telling me that when he was a young fellow, he had a beautiful pet you. And his neighbour was going past. His neighbour was going past. And this pet was crossing the young in front of him. And he says, Oh man, he says, What a nice pet, he says. The pet went down the cat. And somebody was passing. He says, What happened to your pet? Oh, he just dropped a cat, and so and so was passing, and he says, What a beautiful sheep, but he dropped. <laughs> he says, you put gold and silver water on it, he says to me. Mm-hmm. So, well, do you know this model, he says to me. Do you know what I did, he says. I went down, he says, and I got half a crown, he says, and my mother's wedding ring. And I put it in a basin. And I poured a jug of water into that basin. And then I poured that water over the yew. And within five minutes, that yew was up and walking. Well, that's what the man told me for the Lysa. Now, he wasn't supposed to have said anything over the water, was No, he? no, 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 no. Uh-huh. No. And anybody could do this? It wasn't uh, somebody special who had to... No, no, anybody at all. As long as there was gold and silver water, it's proof against the butchach. Yes, yes, yes. Butchach. The butchach. And he, start, he ends by saying, because that was the butchach. Um, it occurred to me that somebody ought to record John McInnes. And I wish I could have recorded him more. And I did, um, I, I haven't brought the tape, but basically I wanted to find a bit. He too also talked about, about um, witchcraft. And he talked about when they were driving the cattle and they would put Orowan into the, woven into the cattle t- tail to keep away. And these are his words, to protect them from magic, from evil spells and so forth. Because the people believed very strongly in that. And the Rowan is one of the famous trees that protects you from malevolent fairies and from witchcraft and the evil eye and the likes. John McInnes. The Rowan tree, of course, I imagine some of you will have a Rowan tree. They're all over. They're even in Edinburgh and Glasgow streets planted by Highlanders who were transplanted into these cities. And would you cut it down? Certainly not. I thought I would sort of test them. Well, what do people believe in Rowans? I know what they said when I was a child. And um, So one particular day, this is the north of Skye, which is where my people are from. Uh, We're backing on to this area here. So I was... Uh, standing with my uncle who's there and uh, it was a Sunday we were going to church but he had to have a cigarette before we left so I said oh look at the gosh me the rowans are lovely the sheer aren't they and that's not the right photo but anyway that's the setting yes he said you know he said yes they're out beside every ruin and he then said these were they were cleared away I said oh oops I said we used to play there when we were oops pardon me what's did I lose the place we would, oh, I might have to go back into this again. He said, we used to play there when we were children. So then I, I said, I wonder why they planted them. Oh, he said, that was to keep away the witches. Now, keep away the witches, they're still seeing this in the 1990s. So in the same area, I thought, well, I, 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 a second uncle who grew up in Portree, he had so many stories about this. But this is a testimonial, he said. Now, this is not a story I've been told. By the way, a story is something that you don't believe. It's not a story. Don't be telling stories now. Tell the truth. Don't be telling stories. This is not a story. I was there. And this is a true one. This is the one about the witchcraft. It happened half a mile out of Portree. And there was a quarry there and all the houses in it now. But, oh, yes. And anyhow, there was a witch there. And she used to put curses on the people. And she read the cups. And on he goes to tell about this night. He, oops, what am I doing wrong? I'm sorry, I touched, oh, I touched something I ought not. And he was in Portree. And um, 
I walked, no. I was going with a lassie. She was a waitress, and she'd only be off about 10. And I wouldn't be going home till about 12 or so, maybe 2 in the morning. Ach, I was young. And there was this fellow, a neighbour of ours, I'll mention no names, and he was always at home at 10 o'clock. And this was on a Monday night, and it was about Forsyth's Corner. The details are quite spectacular in Portree. Anyway, I was going to meet her, and he was standing there, and he says to me, Murdo, what about coming home early with me tonight? Well, I says, what? One in the morning's early for me, or maybe 12. Oh, please, he pleaded. No, I said, I'll be here at 12. So there he was, waiting, and when I saw the lassie home, standing there. And it was after 12 when we started walking. Anyhow, he, he describes this experience. And he, he says, now this is true, this is true, I was there. And he came out of church, he'd come out of church at the corner of Portree, and the Royal Hotel, well, the fellows are always there, you know. And, and anyhow, he stayed there for quite a while, and he enjoyed himself, he started to walk. And he was telling me that before he reached the quarry, you see, a horse came out. And I says to him, well, Johnny, I says to him, well, you're trying to fight, frighten me, and for I'm, because I'm going home early with you. You're making a mistake. So I thought, well, and he goes on, he says, they set off home. And he told me the horse came out at this very quarry and scared the life out of him. Well, but anyhow, he said he had a Bible. He'd been to church, he had a Bible. But the horse came out and he was, so he, I'll race to the end of the story. But that state that he was in, I believed him. I was right there and the horse, I said, well, if it was a real horse, there'll be marks on the road. But we looked in daylight, no marks. And that fellow left the place, he couldn't stay there. Left Achachork and he went to Portree. And so, three minutes, okay, off we said. And the same uncle, without drawing breath, he said, I'll tell you, see, when I worked at the diatomite factory, it was a witch that made that. And he told me another witch story. Or oh, this is the uncle, you notice I'm, 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 I'm my mother's brother who was out shooting hares or rabbits, rabbits. He aimed with a friend, he aimed his gun, cousin was there, he says, and Rory, 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 and he went out of his head, don't, don't, don't shoot, he said, you'll kill, and he named a woman in the village that they would kill. But I race on, I've only got a couple of minutes. Those stories, somehow, or is it the stories? No, it's the, whatever is deep within the psyche, you can call it belief, if you will. They emigrated to the new world, and living in Quebec, as I did, Yes, this was the Stornoway Vous Accueil. Stornoway welcomes you. In this little place here, look at the place names. Tolsta, Golson, Gould, Dell. And, one, and they had communions in each one. Every, so you could go to a whole string of communions, as you can here. And a woman who was walking from Milan to Tolsta and then on to Gould said we always used to collect, and she mentioned the Calioch. But when we got there, she said, she was baking bread. And she said, oh, this was also in Gaelic, she said, I wouldn't be ready for a wee while. Just go on ahead, go on ahead, and I'll see you in church. So they made a good, stri they were striding all the way to church in Gould from Tolsta. And when they got into the church, the woman was already sitting there. And the one woman looked at the other and she says, Pshaw, look at her. And do you know this? The only thing that passed us on the road was a rabbit. Now, Campbell said, superstition shuts out the light, makes the mind unhealthy, and fills it with groundless anxieties. I wonder if it's true. Or, well, Burns also had, as he said, all these phenomena. But at the same time, I'm reminded of a plane journey I took, and lo and behold, wasn't I not sitting beside this is from New York, by the way, to Glasgow. The free church minister, I wouldn't name the community. I said, gosh, it's Halloween tonight. Oh, well, was that a mistake? He said, you surely are not telling me that you would go out at Halloween. Well, I said, we used to, and we saw no... Well, he said, I wouldn't let my children go out. He said, I'll tell you that. It's just nothing but evil. So I said, well, I'd like to think that my faith is strong enough to believe that there's a greater power that will protect me and I would still go out on Halloween. <laughs> well, 
That is just our first for this morning. And what we're going to do is we're now going to move on. We're going to hear from John MacDonald, from Rusty, as many of you will know him as. And uh, we'll then hear from Katrina Murray. So first of all, can I call on John? So to us, Johnny. This is a man that goes by many names. <laughs> John is, we heard a very wide-ranging picture there from, from Margaret, uh, across the Atlantic indeed. Johnny is now going to take us down, deep down, into his own community in North Lochs, around the Lurebust area. And uh, we were talking just before we came in, and, and John was telling me that he's been doing a lot of research recently, not just locally, in terms of uh, oral history and so on, but he's also been using Topa uh, the the Kist of Riches, that some of you will, will know. So, over to you, John, Thank and we'll you. chat later. Oh, what do I press here? Right. right. All right. Okay. I'm a, I'm a bit nervous about this, so if I faint, don't walk out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bushnik and Lurpost. Well, I personally have, have no experience that Bushnik occurred in Lurpost, and some of the stories that I learned tell only of people who believed in Bushnik, but no proof that it actually existed. There's a lot of stories, but no proof. So I, I have an open mind on whether Bushnik was in Lourdes or not. On the topics list, false accusations. Well, that was usually men accusing women of being involved in Bushnik. I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later in the conclusion. Sheep, sometimes sheep were brought into the, the, the situation when the if someone counted sheep, that was supposed to put a spell on sheep. If there was a black sheep in a herd, that was connected with a bushnik in some way. And fishing, there was quite a few connected with fishing. Men avoiding contact with women when they went fishing. There's a lot of that. I, I've seen that myself. I didn't believe it myself. But. And then there's a boiling bottle, and this is the... the the Lurpus equivalent of a, a voodoo doll. That's. <laughs> then I'll have the conclusion. I just used that as a, a backdrop just now. Well, I was born and brought up. <laughs> it's interesting. I don't know if any of them were ever used in Lurpus. <laughs> So I was born and brought up in Lurfost, and I've lived there most of my life. And I was born, born in our, our old house. Now, you've heard of Tesco and the co-op doing home delivery as well. I was home delivery as well. <laughs> so I was born in 1955, and my generation caught the very end of uh, people believing in Bushnik and the very end of uh, storytelling about Bushnik. But the, none, none of my contemporaries believed in Bushnik. They never talked about it. So I, I assume no one really believed in it. Now, going back two generations, there was a lot who believed in Bushnik, and there was a lot of stories going around about it. Now, m most of the what I'll tell you came from that man there. He was from Lourdes, but he was known as Murakamago, Mother MacLeod, and it, most of his working years were spent as a teacher in Edinburgh. And he was born in 1904, died in, died in 1977. And in 1970s, the School of Scottish Studies recorded him. And I found these recordings on Top and Dwarfish. They were recorded in Gaelic, and he spoke about know his, his days in, in, in Lourdes and he's used many topics but one of the topics the only one I'm interested in just now is he talked about Bushnik so most of the material I've got came from his recordings now 
one of the one of the stories he told was was about two two women, two vulnerable women. That that runs through the stories. Vulnerable woman being accused of Bushnicht, falsely accused. Talks of two women. One of them had been widowed when she was young. She had no children and she was living on her own. And the other one had never married and she was living on her own and in what Margaret described as a bohan, which I assume was a hovel. And he said they were both uh, pitiful souls. I think that they, they had no money and were very poor and they were an easy target for men to accuse them of Bushnicht. No, they, they, were, they were accused, there were, were two things women were usually accused. I, I think it was universal. One of them was that they stopped cows from giving milk. And another was that they, they took the goodness out of soil so that crops wouldn't grow. They were accused of that, among other things. And I myself was amongst a group of boys who falsely accused a uh, uh, and uh, an old woman of being a witch, we never said it to her. Now that area you see there between the electricity poles on the road running right to left, we used to play football there from the age of about 18, 8 to 15, something like that, known as Liana Carney. Now the house on, on the right, the brown house, that's Teufer Gjallan, Margjallan's house. Now Margjallan was uh, a career soldier, he was for many years in the Seaforth Highlanders and latterly he was in charge of the Home Guard in Lourdes during the Second World War. And in his final years in the Seaforth, he was a recruiting sergeant in Betty Hill in Sutherland. And that's where he met his wife, Kirsty Murray, and she was from Betty Hill. And they got married and they moved to that house in Lourdes. And when I was growing up, Marie Allen had, had died and she was in her own, no family, and she was tall and thin, and being a widow, and the custom of the time was that widow wore black clothes. And so that's on the on their wedding day. So we'd be there playing football, and sometimes, you know, we'd see, we called it Kallich for Gjall, we'd see Kallich for Gjall coming out of the house, and we'd stop playing, and we'd say, oh, there's Kallich for Gjall, and she's a witch, she's a witch. Now we got the idea from her being tall, thin, wearing black clothes, and from the books we read and the comics we read, they had characters of witches dressed just like that, similar to that, tall, thin, dressed in black. So we, we never said anything to her, we never, we never shouted abuse, we never said anything like that, we never talked to adults about it, nothing like that, they never talked to us, they never mentioned this woman's a witch, no one said anything. But I think what we were doing was following the tradition of isolating and falsely accusing a woman of practicing Bushnicht. Even though we were kids at the time, we still, we were learning from what adults had been doing. So that was Kajich for Gjala. That was taken in, taken in Lurpas a few years ago. Now, Marge Mango had a, a neighbor called Alstad, and Alstad believed in Bushnicht. Now, Marge Mago's mother seemed to be a woman who had a great sense of humor. And Nalster was a neighbor, and every year he would send his sheep and lambs to the moor, to the Lurpos moor, and he would have to pass by the Mago's house. Now, Marge Mago's mother, knowing him being the neighbor, she knew when he would pass the house. So she made sure that she was standing in the doorway when he went past, and she would count the sheep, one, uh, three, kehe, four, and this made him really angry. He thought she, she was casting a spell on the sheep. She was only white in the man up. <laughs> Using a bit of bush to myself, I would change one of these white sheep into a black sheep. Now, if you keep an eye on the far right, the third sheep there, with a bit of bushnich, it'll turn into a black sheep. What you show? I've got the power. <laughs> Technology. A, a, a neighbour of ours, I, I won't name him, <laughs> some of you will know him, but I won't name him. He, 
he had a herd of sheep. No, he believed in Bushnich. He strongly believed in it. He denied his belief, but he did believe it. This year, I'd have been eight or nine, and one of his sheep gave birth to a black lamb. Now, what followed next, what really shocked me, and I think it might shock you as well, he killed it. Now, he believed, well, a lot of people believe that having a black sheep or a black lamb brought bad luck on the rest of the herd. Brought a couple to go, but they... Uh, now this man, he, he had a good sense of humour, and he was good to us children living in the area. And he, he had a good sense of humour, and he sometimes wore a Glengarry cap. And sewn to the side of the cap, was with a red thread, was a chicken wishbone. Now he, he told everyone, this is to ward away the Bushnik. He didn't laugh and joke about it. But at the same time, when killing the lamb, you know, as well, he believed in it. That he was... He laughed, but he was believed. He, he believed in it. Now, in the 19, early 1950s, uh, Professor Magnus Oftedal from Oslo University came to Lurbost, and he was researching. He was going to write a book about the Gaelic of the village. It's called the Gaelic of Lurbost. There's nothing unique about our Gaelic. It had to come somewhere. And one of the people he interviewed for the book was our neighbour. And in the, in the interview, our neighbour says. That he, he didn't believe in Bushnik. Although he talked about it a lot, he only did it to entertain the neighbours. And he was an entertaining man. And he also said that the, when the next Labour government would come in, they'd get rid of all the witches. <laughs> well, we just lost the witch of a Prime Minister a wee while ago. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I have lost my thread. <laughs> and he also said, and this is a serious bit about witches, he said, when all the witches that existed in the world then, when they all died, the world would be a better place. And I was thinking, I read this, oh, he's serious now. He's joking and it's also serious. But I believe that deep down, he did believe in Bushnik and that it could be harmful. I was her neighbour. Fishing. Well, there was a lot, a lot of superstitions to do with fishing as well. Uh, a friend of Marahamago Nyan, he was he was a fisherman, and he was down the shore of Lurbost repairing a boat he had. Now Nyan believed that all of his wife's relatives had the bushnik. Now I assume he meant just the woman, not the men, just the woman. And one day as Ian was down repairing the boat. He bought new wood for it and everything. He was down repairing the boat, and Shonat, one of his wife's relatives and her husband, were passing by, and Shonat spoke to Ian, and Ian thought, oh, she's casting a spell on me on the boat. So he stopped repairing the boat. He just left it. Now, Marumago said, well, his workmanship wasn't up to much service, so it was better that the boat wasn't repaired. <laughs> And there's another story about Ian when he and neighbours were going fishing. They were going out to fish for carp in, uh, in the Minch. And the neighbours were down the shore waiting for him. And Ian wasn't turning up. They were wondering, where is he? And they waited a wee while on the door side of Ian. So they went back up to the village and they went into Ian's house and asked him, no, why didn't you turn up? And I, <laughs> He said, as he was walking down the craft, he was walking, he had some food with him. They were going to be out for a while. He had fishing lines. He had a coil of rope around his shoulder. And as he was walking down the craft, one end of the coil of rope became undone, wrapped itself around his feet, and he fell. And he immediately blamed Shonat, his wife's relative. So he got up, turned around, went back to the house, and they didn't go fishing that day. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there was another one. Ian Donald's brother. Now, he believed in Bushnik as well. Now, his craft was next door to the Marcus craft. And when he was going down the craft, working on the craft, he'd walk up and down a path right beside the Marco boundary. But when he was going fishing, he'd go over to the far side of the craft. This was to avoid Marco's mother. <laughs> She was, she, she'd wind him up when, when she saw him walking down the far side of the craft. She knew he was going fishing, 
And she said to him, Donald, are you going fishing? <laughs> she knew fine that he was going fishing. And he, he, he completely ignored it, even though they were neighbors. He, 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 maybe he thought, well, if I talk to her, the spell will work. But I'd carry on doing the craft. Now, there's a man who enjoyed fishing. He didn't believe in bushnish. But I, I know of some men, I knew of some men within the room today in the community who did believe in bushnish. And there, there was one man especially, and there was, there was a woman living near him. She was living on her own. And he'd, every time he went fishing, he did his best to avoid this poor woman. The poor woman wasn't a witch, nowhere near it. She was quite a pleasant woman. And he did his best to avoid her. Now, when you think, when some of these men went fishing, they would, some days they wouldn't see a woman, they'd go fishing and they wouldn't catch anything. Who would they blame for that? There'd be other times they went fishing, a woman talked to them and they caught a lot of fish. What would they do if it was the same? Or maybe the spell didn't work that time. Oh, yeah. There, oh, there's, a, there's a beauty. Now, some of the older ones, I'd set that up on the stove a few weeks ago. Now, some of the older ones amongst you will recognize a screw top bottle. Jock, I? <laughs> it was, well, a few years ago for, for selling beer. Now, this is a story of another woman who lived on her own and her supply of peats ran out. So she went to a, the old man who lived next door and he believed in Bushnik. She went into his house. Now, she seldom visited his house and as soon as she walked in, he was, became suspicious. He was thinking, she came into the house to cast a spell on me. So <laughs> as, as soon as the, the, the woman, he thought, she, you know, she, she was using lack of pizza pretext for entering his house. So as soon as she, she left the house, he got a bottle, filled it with water. Now this was to represent the woman. And he put the, the bottle in a pan and boiled it. And this was him using Bushnik himself to her harm the woman. But of course, nothing came of it. There's another beauty. These are the kind of witches we have in Lourdes. <laughs> I shall come to a conclusion now. Now, the thread I found running through the stories was that women living on their own were singled out and accused, falsely accused of witchcraft, Bushnik. Now, I think what it really was was cases of misogyny. Men either disliking or even hating, hating women they singled these women out and they used Bushnik as an, an excuse for singling them out. That's my own opinion now. I'll close with this line. It's a long sentence, so I had to write it down in case I forgot it. <laughs> what I am saying is that the supposed use of Bushnik in the village of Lurbost came from the imaginations of a minority of men who falsely accused lone, innocent women. Thank you. That was quite a walk through Lurebost. I'm just very glad I don't croft in Lurebost. <laughs> now, can you please welcome to the stage Katrina Murray? <laughs> Katrina uh, currently works as a lecturer at UHI Hebrides. And lectures, let me just get this right, it's, it's such an incredibly interesting list of topics covered within her Gaelic studies. She covers history of the Gaeltoch, significantly the social history of the Gaeltoch, cultural anthropology, oral history, and something called islandness. I'll leave the rest to you, Katrina. <laughs> Thank you. Martin. Um... There you go. The, I knew the microphone would have to be lowered for me. Let's hope it's only the microphone gets lowered and not the tone. <laughs> um, 
I'd, I'd like to add my own um, appreciation of your, your presence here to um, Agnes's opening words. Uh, I think it's really encouraging that there's such an interest in, um, in our folklore. Uh, it's also a little worrying that so many of you were willing to get up this early on a Saturday <laughs> morning to come and hear about witchcraft, and I think maybe names and addresses should be taken so that we have <laughs> some sort of register before they all leave. Um, I've really enjoyed the opening to uh, addresses um, on, as, as Agnes was saying, on Bushnyak, but coming at it from two different perspectives. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that Shawnee used some of the material that I was planning on, on mentioning myself, but uh, them's the breaks. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation because I think that's the way that witchcraft can sometimes infiltrate on an occasion like this by using PowerPoints. We've all heard of death by PowerPoint and I, I consider it to be very much a black art that I'm going to avoid. Um, I think one of the things that is makes this a challenging topic compared to, say, um, you know, Margaret alluded to things like in the Archaeolog, the Second Sight, and ghosts, and Halloween beliefs, and these kinds of things. People were much more open, I think, um, historically, and even now are more open about talking about the Second Sight, for example, and it's much easier to get accounts. I don't like the word stories either, because as you say, I think stories implies something that's been made up. It's much easier to get history, yachtri, or accounts of, of the second sight and ghosts than it is um, concerning Ushnach. I think in a community like this, people were quite reticent about speaking too openly about it. And it was interesting what Shawnee was saying there about um, <clears throat> the, the woman that he and his pals suspected of being a witch or believed to be a witch, but they never actually accused her people didn't necessarily come out openly and say these things for very good reason. If you believed in the power of witchcraft um, and that you may indeed be a victim of it in some way, you'd be pretty careful who you accused. If you were a skeptic and you didn't believe in such a thing, then you, you didn't want to inflict reputational damage on, as you were saying, they're vulnerable elderly women in many cases. Um, and, and thirdly, of course, if you were a practitioner of it, <laughs> you had a good reason for, for not speaking about it openly. Um, recently, or relatively recently, uh, I was giving a, a similar talk, or a talk on a similar topic, elsewhere in the island. And when I say elsewhere in the island, you're all thinking, oh, I bet it was Tolsta, it wasn't Tolsta. <laughs> I'll come to Tolsta later. Um, it was on the west side, in fact, and afterwards, uh, a lady came up to me and she said, uh, and, and I would say there's probably a generation between us in terms of age, and she said uh, when she was young, she used to hear her mother and other female relatives and female mm. neighbours talking about certain women in the village, this one and that one, um, in connection with Bushnach, having Bushnach, or sometimes you'd hear it called Skolhu, literally the black school, but um, meaning dabbling in the, in the black arts. Um, and she said, the minute they thought that you were listening, especially as a child, the minute they thought you were overhearing their conversation, they would clam up and they would tell you to butt out. Now, although a generation separates me and this lady in age, I would say that was my own experience as well growing up. You'd be trying to find out who, who they suspected and whose, whose family was reputed to be involved in this. But it was incredibly difficult to, to glean any information. And it, it's very much the realms of gossip and rumour and you would get snippets and slivers and nothing, nothing very substantial. But we both agreed that one of the words we used to overhear a lot in these conversations as puzzled us both, and puzzled lots of others as well, I'm sure, was the Gaelic word krunkan. And to this day, I, I often think about um, krunkan as being sort of the ultimate prop of the Lewis witch. Um, when you think of witches in terms of the, the very glamorous Eurpost witch at the end of Shawnee's presentation, um, and some of the, the things Margaret alluded to in her talk as well. You think of the pointy hat, 
You think of the cauldron, you think of the black cat, you think of the broomstick, but for the Lewis witch, the prop of props is the crocan. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, a crocan is nothing more fantastical than a ball of yarn. It's just a ball of yarn. And when I used to hear them talking about witches, hear adults talking about witches and talking about the crocan, I used to think, what? Well, what on earth? I, could, I just couldn't make the leap of imagination between what, what this very domestic item was. I mean, when I was a child, the women round about used to come in in that evening to visit my mother, and she used to go to them, and they'd all have their knitting bags. And they would spend the evening yarning, chatting, and, and knitting. Um, and so it was something that I certainly didn't associate with, with witchcraft in any way, and I couldn't figure out. But I realise now that there are a couple of ways in which potentially um, the, the accoutrements of knitting could also be the accoutrements of, of witchcraft. Um, people talk about it in terms of being a, a sort of an, an aid memoir, a, a way of memorising or a way to help you remember an incantation. Because I'm not a knitter myself, but I mean, I've been around knitters enough to know it's very repetitive. It can be quite rhythmic. It involves counting. And it's believed that some people used it as a, an accompaniment to gesach, which is making, making a spell or saying a spell or giving an incantation. Um, and the other potential way, of course, is that, that knots were believed to be used in, in witchcraft, uh, especially in terms of weather. And it probably won't surprise you to know that the Lewis witches were reputed to be very good at raising gales, raising storms. And, you know, if there's any question about them still being active today, <laughs> I, think, I think look out the window and you usually have your answer. But knots were used to, to bind up bad weather. And, of course, knots could be loosed in order to unleash bad weather, which is why so many sailors and fishermen were particularly superstitious uh, regarding witches. One of the stories I recall, one of the accounts I recall hearing when I was young, and this related to a woman, I didn't know her, but I could have known her, so she was, she was alive in my lifetime. Um, she was alleged to have been seen. She lived on the east side of Lewis, and you're thinking Tolsta again, aren't you? But it's not, still not Tolsta. Um, she lived on the east side of Lewis, and she was alleged to have been seen on a number of occasions going round her, not her house, going round houses, as in circumnavigating the houses, actually anti-clockwise, and knitting behind her back. Which I think is quite a touchy. I can't knit in front of my face, but knitting behind her back. Um, I think if, if, like me, you were raised on a diet of hammer horror films and things like that, um, you probably know that any kind of inversion is seen as being indicative of or, or symbolising evil. So probably that's what the behind her back was about, unless she was maybe just showing off. Um, so the knitting, the crocan um, behind her back. But going round the house anti-clockwise is significant as well, because our forefathers believed very much in the concept of doing everything jishol, sunwise, to the, to the right. Um, and that was a way of invoking a good luck. Margaret mentioned going round the bounds of the, of the community or round the bounds of houses uh, with, with fire, and that, was, that would be done jishol, and that was to, to protect and to bring, to bring good luck. So somebody seen going tuahul, which was the opposite, anti-clockwise or anti-sunwise, um, the implication is that she was up to no good. Um, the way I actually heard it, it was her own house that she was seen at, but, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would she be trying to bring bad luck on, on her own house? And the village was back. There's no point being coy about it, because you're all still thinking Tolsta, so I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, the other things that Lewis witches, besides raising storms and, and using the using the crook and um, the other things that were known for, uh, some of them, Shawnee Rusty touched on, uh, the is a phrase you would hear a lot in, in Gaelic. Um, 
and it wasn't so much drying up the milk supply as ensuring that the milk supply that would come had no nutritional value. And I have to say, the other thing he mentioned there about taking the goodness out of the, the soil, out of the land, that's something I've heard much more from your own side of the, the island than anywhere else. Tortava as in halo, taking the taking the fertility, I suppose, out of the ground. But when you think about it, the whole thing is linked. Because if there's no nutrients in the in the soil, then the grass isn't going to be good. The milk supply is not going to be good. Um, and by extension, another accusation that was often levelled, though usually not again, not overtly, people just thought it and whispered amongst themselves about certain neighbours, was connected with the making of butter. Um, there's quite a number, on Tobra Nualachish itself, there's quite a number of accounts of people saying that when they would be trying to churn the butter, the butter wouldn't form, the butter wouldn't turn into butter. You can tell I'm very knowledgeable on, on the whole process. Um, and that was attributed to this woman or that woman who was a witch. But there again, you can see that it's, it's part of the whole attack on, um, on, on, the, on the land, on the, on the milk cow, and so on. And these, and so many of the other things that people would talk about, were really just, I think, people articulating their own fears. The thing you feared the most, the thing you held dearest and most precious, or the thing you relied on most, your milk cow. Uh, for example, or your, your little patch of land, the big fear was that anything would happen to, to make it less productive, to make it less usable. And so I think quite often these accusations were just, there were fear being articulated in a, in a particular way. And yet, still not really articulated, as we've said, people kind of kept it very much uh, to themselves. Um, one story I've heard from South Lochs, I think it was. Um, I'm not sure, it might be Kinloch. Uh, I'd have to check. Relating to something that, that was mentioned earlier as well, uh, was the, this, this idea of shape shifting, which again the Lewis witches were deemed to be very good at. And the two, two shapes that they tended to assume most often, one was mentioned already, the hair, a gyar, but the other one was the furlack the seagull, the humble, humble seagull. Um, and there was one particular fishing boat that used to go out from whichever one it was, Kinloch or Southlochs, and uh, there was always a seagull following it. And they were, of course, fishermen, they were superstitious and they were a bit nervous. So they decided one day they were going to do something about it. Um, or one of them decided, I think this was often the case, there would be one more hot-headed person than, than the rest. So he, he put silver coins into the barrel of his gun. And he, you know, of course, about the whole idea of silver and, and gold being efficacious against evil. The, I think Margaret's, one of her slides, had the silver and gold and water uh, to, to protect the cattle. So this man put silver coins into into his gun and shot at the seagull. But being a lochi, he wasn't a very good shot. So he, he just managed, he glanced the, the shot off the seagull's leg. Um, I should say they were very suspicious of a particular old woman of being the furlock that was following their boat. And when they returned to the village, uh, the first news that reached them was that this Kalyach had broken her leg. So make of that what you will. Um, but I stand here as a, as a resident of Tolsta. So I think, you know, if I don't bring it up, you're going to. So I suppose uh, b before I finish, I should really say something about that. Because inevitably, if you talk about this subject, people are going to ask um, whether or why there's any, why Tolsta is particularly seen as the witchcraft capital of the Western Isles. <laughs> And um, I, I very carefully said I'm a resident of Tolsta, I'm not a native of Tolsta, so you have no need to fear me, I have no actual powers of my own. Um, some people have tried to dismiss it 
uh, John McLeod, I think it was in his book on the Isle Aid, when I heard the bell, he refers to it as being this reputation for Tolsta as being the result of a prank, a newspaper prank from the 1930s. And I think James Shaw Grant, the late James Shaw Grant, who was at one time editor of the Stornoway Gazette and who wrote several books on local history, he also thought that it was a prank that had just gone too far or had been had been believed more than it should be. Um, I, I can't really say that I, I think that's right. I actually don't think Tolsta had any more instances of it, especially having listened to, to Shawnee, I don't think Tolsta had any more instances of Bushnuk than other places or of suspect, I think I suppose we have to call it alleged Bushnuk, don't we have to be careful, we don't want to be sued. Um, I don't think it had any more than other places. Um, I don't even think it was talked about any more than other places, because certainly growing up, I heard as many stories connected with other parts of the island as I did with Tolsta, if not more. Maybe Tolsta was so good at Bushnuk that they were very good at keeping it to themselves. And I do know people in the village who just like the men Johnny was referring to there, most of them fishermen, um, who would go out of their way to avoid certain women. It wasn't all women. Um, they were, they're a wee bit more discerning than the Lochis. The Lochis obviously just carefully avoid all women. Um, but the, the Tolsta men, it was certain women who were under suspicion. And they would cross the road to avoid them. They would turn the other way to avoid them. And in their fishing days, these men, if they were on their way to the boat to put out to sea, and they met certain women, they would turn back. They just wouldn't go. They wouldn't put out to sea. Um, so there was certainly belief in the village in Bushnuk, but I don't think to any greater degree than there was in any other village in the island at that time. Tolsta's a wee bit uncanny in terms of its location, I think. That might have contributed to, to, to a degree. Tolsta's quite lonely, and in the days before transport was as good as it is now and before communication was as good as it is now, it was a place you only went to if, if, you, if you had a purpose in going there. You weren't passing through Tolsta to go to anywhere else. It's also the highest village in the island, both in the geographical sense and in, the, in every other sense. And I think another thing we can't ignore, and it hasn't really been mentioned apart from Margaret's plane journey um, back from the States, in Tolsta you have fairly conspicuous um, if, you can, if you can be ostentatiously Presbyterian, and I know that's a bit of an oxymoron, but if you can be, if you can be ostentatiously Presbyterian, Tolsta's probably ostentatiously Presbyterian. And in places wh where, not just in this island, where you had great religiosity, alongside that, you often had rumours of sinister goings on. Because I think that a good Presbyterian shines brighter against a black backdrop, if that makes any sense. And I, I think there was maybe an element of that in the, in the Tolsta situation. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, uh, three really, really thought-provoking presentations there. So we're going to talk about some of that amongst ourselves and maybe just pick up on some of the, the stories that you weren't able to tell, Margaret, um, having cut you off in your prime, as I did. Um, but it's so interesting to see how some of the, the themes that you were touching on were then being picked up both by Shawnee and by Katrina. Uh, and I just wondered, just com coming to yourself, first of all, some of these uh, themes which were being presented to us there very much in, a, in island terms, have you in your work come across the very same kind of things, albeit by another name, in your research which has taken you really quite far across the world? Yes, and oops. Just right up to your mouth. Is it on? Yeah. Yes, um, I, it's remarkable how people are more willing to talk about witchcraft in somebody else's community than their own. And the funny thing is, when I was looking for we snips to play here, I came across, a, I thought it was a wonderful one from Barra. I'll tell you about the last witch in Skye, said that one. And then another one entirely, 
oh, well, there was a witch in Barra, and away they go. And I wondered if it's a, just a, a tendency, spoken or unspoken, to, to disconnect yourself. Although I did go to Tyree to ask if, gosh me, is this being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> to ask him if, because I never met some of these Tyree uh, tellers, they were dead before I, uh, anyway, I, and, but some of the families were remembered. And gosh, they retold their stories and the, the, <laughs> the classic was, what? His stories. Oh, his mother was a witch. <laughs> so unsaid with complete conviction. But it's um, it's it's a huge subject, isn't it? It is. I did wonder about the witch and the story in Quebec from Tolsta, Quebec. <laughs> I think it'll be on. It'll be on. Is it on? It is on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, doesn't, doesn't, to me, I sound like I'm just talking to myself, which is nothing keep it, new. Keep it closer to um, you. Katrina, keep it closer to you. Close, yeah. 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 But, um, of course, I, I mustn't mumble, because as we've heard already, mumbling is a, a sure sign that you're, that you're uttering a spell. I think, I think what, what you're saying there is right, Margaret, about people being more willing to point the finger to, to other communities. Um, and I found the same thing in, in researching this and other other talks. Uh, you'll find a Lewis person talking about the last the last witch in sky. You'll find a, a new Ishtuch talking about the stories connected with Lewis. Um, and I think it's part and parcel of that distancing that goes on. That othering, I suppose. You know, where Shawnee was talking about the, the misogyny. Um, I think it's it's what we call nowadays othering. And if you can make it about other people, then you're somehow you're removing yourself from the from the picture and enables you to stand back. And Although there are people who say, now I was there, this is not a story. I was mm. there myself. And, and they associate themselves with the story. Or there's the one, well, this is a friend of a friend of mine. You probably know him. And you'll say, oh, yes, I do know him. And so it's sort of, it, it's, it, it adds to the, to the, to the more the, you people will believe it, the credulity, etc. It's interesting what um, you were saying, Shawnee, uh, how uh, physical features came to be associated with, uh, you know, being a sure sign that somebody was a witch. And you, you wonder, you know, why, why would somebody tall and dressed in black be particularly well, considered a witch? I, I think where it came from, for us anyway, was from books and cartoons and comics. Books. Oh, yes, because I'd never heard it. Uh, you see, I'm far older than you are. I don't but, know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I I'd never that heard either. the tall black <laughs> person as, as which, other than in story books, maybe. And it was a bit of mystery, but and I never heard anybody tell a story about it. Not that there isn't such a thing. <laughs> I think that's why we branded that this woman, Margarita's wife, a witch because of the illustrations we had seen, tall, thin, dressed in black, living on her own, she must be a witch. I think that's, that's what pointed us towards accusing her of being a witch. But it's about being different to Katrina, isn't it? It's about, it's about picking on the person who, who is different, albeit that they might have powers of interpretation, have powers of... of foresight, hindsight, whatever. But there's so many aspects to that. Yes, I, I think, you know, we've been saying that people weren't outright accused in our communities, like Shawnee was talking about the, the woman that was dressed in black and was, lucky I'm not tall and thin, otherwise I would be seriously under <laughs> suspicion. Um, but, and, and in a way you think, oh, well, it's quite kind. They, didn't, they weren't turning up at her door with pitchforks. And, but it's not kind because they were the, they were the butt of rumour and gossip. And it, it probably just added to the, the sense of their isolation that everybody else was bound together in this almost conspiracy of talking about them. And this probably isolated, uh, as I think you used the term vulnerable women, and I think the, the two that Morohomago was talking about in particular, where nowadays you would view them as through a gaka, poor soul, um, but because of that, and on some level people knew then that they were also worthy of sympathy, but at the same time 
that just augmented the sense of their, their difference. And I think the, the misogyny as well, I think it points to a, a deeper problem that these people had. They just used the Bushnik as, a, as a, a way of targeting these women. I mean, if, if they were living somewhere else, they might have used another way. Well, well see, in, in, in Iran just now, they're using religion to target women. Women marching for the rights have been shot in the streets. Well, that's another form of misogyny. Well, misogyny is really bully. That's what it is. And it's carried out by cowards. It's brilliant to hear you say that, Tikhani. Oh, yes. It's just, you, you're uh, the hero of this room. <laughs> I'm surrounded by women. <laughs> it's, um, coming back to yourself, Margaret, um, and again, look, look at the topic from, from, if you like, a more strategic perspective, you picked up um, many stories that present men as witches. There are a few, yes, um, and sometimes they involve the black art and blacksmithing and so on. Um, but it, it, apparently, about eighty percent of them are women. Um, I did hear one though, the one that the uncle who told the one about the horse, etc. And I mean, he was terrified of this witch who was a woman, I said. However, he had a second one, the one that he told about the diatomite in Skye. And that was, in a way, the witch came out on top in every way, because it was like the, the number of outside forces involved. And I don't know if you're familiar, this diatomite factory in the north of Skye, they drained a loch and they were mining diatomite. And it, it had, it, it had gone bankrupt, and then another firm, a German firm, came in and took over and started up again in the 50s. So that man on my slide, he worked in the factory. But it went well. He said, when they were doing this in the first place, from the, they, were taking, they made a wee railway um, from the loch across the Staffordmoor to Uig, where it was being loaded up and put into the factory and then shipped away. And without a buy or leave, the people putting in the railway went across the croft of this woman who was known to be a witch. But she was also a true and a poor soul. And she came out and, you know, it wasn't much of a piece of land. It was a small croft and it wasn't a good croft, but they were literally going to steamroll over her. And she asked them and pleaded not to do that, and, but they insisted, and she, she cursed them. And she said she was putting a curse on the railway and she was putting a curse on their factory. That was that. But anyway, the uncle, meanwhile, working in the, he said they had the best of engineers, best of machinery. He said in the first load, they loaded up in Newark Harbor and the boat went bottom up in Newark Bay. The whole lot went to the bottom. And the next thing to happen was the machines broke down. They brought in engineers, but whatever they did, they could not get those machines to run. So he said, they should have listened. And then on it went until finally it goes bankrupt and nobody wins except the witch. Well, it's their own fault. They should have listened to her in the first place. So there's a slight respect for this witch. Indeed. And yes. Indeed. Okay, I think we'll now uh, open it to questions from yourselves. You've been listening very patiently um, and we've been well informed. So maybe we've got microphones. I think we usually have microphones for questions from the floor. I think Alex is there. Two seconds and we'll just swan down here. As a Vian, Madi Alice. I hope so, yeah. I was interested in the panel's opinion that from the viewpoint we all agree that throughout history and in all around the world, religion has obviously transcended law when it comes to settling scores, i.e. take Salem where we could say that it was used to prove that somebody was a witch, even though historically looking back, it's not. Are there any cases that when you look at, you can't actually say, well, there's no evidence to say they weren't a witch or a warlock? Along the lines of, you know, being paranoid means they're not out to get you. Could you want to try to respond to that? 
Yeah, that's, it's, it's an interesting question, and it's actually an aspect of it that we didn't think about today, or we didn't really consider today the possibility that, of course, um, maybe some people were dabbling in, in the dark arts. Um, it's, it's really difficult because, as I said, there's, there's, other than the, if you were to start looking at the witch trials, the actual legal cases, even these the evidence doesn't necessarily stack up, but it doesn't stack up either way in some cases. Um, Agnes asked a, a wee while ago about, about men, um, and there's one reasonably well-documented accusation against um, a, a male witch of performing a particularly horrible rite, uh, which I'm sure Margaret's familiar with, Tagaram Nunghat. The, the summoning of the devil by roasting cats on a spit over a fire. Now, if he was actually observed to do that, then I would say it's fairly cut and dried. You'd have to say, well, he was obviously, he was up to something. Um, but because people, in the, you know, in the absence of being able to say, we, we saw somebody actually doing this. Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't think you can. The other thing is, um, you mentioned the boiling bottles, but what you had in other parts of... Um, the, uh, I don't know about the island, but certainly beyond, you had the corp clea, the, the clay the clay images, like a, basically a voodoo doll made of clay. Now, some of these have been found, so there's certainly um, physical evidence there that there was a belief in it and an attempt at practising it. Whether it had any effect, of course, we don't know. Well, we sort of do, because... We're, sorry to interrupt. And, this one is a, it's sort of shocking, the idea of making a clay image and putting pins in it. But actually, Don Sinclair, who was on the one who, who I didn't play any, he told quite a bit about clay images and they would. However, only about, gosh me, now I can't name the person in this, but I will say they were from Aberdeenshire. Um, one of the travellers was going to Tennessee to talk about Scottish traditions. And I happened to be there for the summer school, so I said, oh, I should go and meet him at the airport, because he's never been to America. I'd like him to feel it. So he came off the plane. He was a storyteller, a singer. He was a very good speaker. And I said, hello. And hello, he said, can't speak. I said, oh, I said, you have one of those aeroplane dry throats. No, 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 he said, I did not. Can you hear me? Yeah. And in that voice, he told me, as I said, oh, 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 wait, you, I'll make you a cup of tea. I did the, all the bits we do. And he said, no, he, he wouldn't be able to speak for the whole two weeks because his voice was completely destroyed. He said his cousin was jealous that he was going and she wasn't. So she witched him. Oh, come on, I said. How do you think she witched you? I know exactly, he said in that same voice. She made a clay doll and she stuck pins in his throat, and then she put it in the river, and he named the river, so it'll never be found, and I'll never be, and I said, but, you know, no matter the pleading he was, he was having, and he, had a, he, he really couldn't speak, I said, naming him, do you not think, however, as much as she believes in that, you might be able to say, with a bit of willpower, I reject that. That's the power of evil and the power of darkness, which I reject. So he said he might think about it. I said, well, and then, of course, anything can make us. I said, I can get sick thinking about something that's not going to happen. My stomach is churning away. There's nothing wrong with my stomach, but it feels like it. Could that not be so? So he thought about that. Anyway, the good news is the voice came back, and he was using the phrase, I reject that. So I'm no psychologist, but the fact that somebody believed in the Cree, and he told me the very river it was in. Interesting, interesting. Spooky. Spooky, indeed. Any other questions or comments? Oh, we've got two hands up here. Anella, and then we'll come to Rhoda, I think. Yeah. I've got a wee story, um, but it's about another Tolsta. It's not North Tolsta, but Tolsta Hurwish. And I feel a bit bad for telling it. It's this othering kind of thing. Um, but my grandfather was from Tolsta Hurwish, so um, I'm 
I feel okay telling it now. Uh, my father was, uh, in his youth, he used to plough fields. And he was in Tolsta. My father was from Dune. And he was ploughing for this man who was a church elder in the morning. But just before they broke for lunch, my father went to speak to the lady, this lady who was accused of being a witch. And I don't remember if he said to her to do something or not. But anyway, after lunch, they came out and she was sitting there with long, something tells me it was white socks up past her knee. And when the elder saw this, he said to my father, right, we are as well to stop because nothing is going to grow here. And there was another man who had a, a, a bakery business and he would not take his van into Tolsta Hulish for love nor money because he thought that his van would break down. He just would not go into the village. But I was just wondering the, the relationship between church and Bushnok. Was that unusual for a church elder to believe that this lady had the power to stop his crops growing? What do you think, Johnny? Was it unusual? For, for whom should care? Was, the, was it unusual for somebody like a church elder to, to believe that witchcraft was actually being well, imp implemented? Well, m maybe they would have believed it, but I, I think it would have been dangerous for them to let the congregation or, or other elders or the minister know that they believed in something like that. Well, they had, what was his name? John Gregerson Campbell, he, he was a minister, but he wrote about witchcraft, as if he believed. Who was this? John Gregerson Campbell. Oh, yes. But, well, I actually think it would be quite, in, in their era, quite common for, for ministers to believe in the existence of witchcraft because the Bible is full of references about rejecting witchcraft, have nothing to do with witchcraft. And if there wasn't a belief in, as such a belief in the power of light, there's a belief, uh, an acknowledgement of the power of darkness in which you would place witches. And because there's so many wenches in the Bible about witches, then the, the witch or the concept of the witch would be certainly in the psyche of, of theological students. They would discuss it and maybe say, oh, etc. So they were very aware, but many of them took, and most of them, I think, would have taken the stand it's a power of darkness which we must reject. Katrina? Well, uh, the, the interesting thing Margaret mentions there about the, the Bible and mm. it, it, witches appear in the Bible, mm. but the word that we use for witch in Gaelic is never used in the Gaelic Bible. They don't use Banavuchach, they use Bodnach. Bodnach yes. is a and she, a woman who had a, who had a fairy lover. Um, think, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, well, it, yes. That, I think that happens with other concepts, the biblical word. For example, in the, uh, the word wraith. Um, there's a, one of these ministers, again, who wrote about folklore, James Napier, he wrote about um, see, seeing a ghost, it's called by this, or a wraith, and it's the part where um, Christ's spirit is witnessed by Paul, and he, he talks about seeing his spirit, and it, it's, when you look, there's various translations of it, and they don't use the word that we might use, oh, it's a ghost, that just sounds pretty awful in scriptural terms, but, but if we look at it, it's I, quite interesting. I think in that context, it's probably because of the spiritual side yes. of it, but when it comes to witch, I just wonder whether um, the concept of witch, as we understand it now, was present in Gaelic culture, and We've been hugely influenced, as we've heard, from comic books and, and the popular image of the witch. And we don't, it's, it's difficult now to separate out what was indigenous to Gaelic culture and what's, what's come in through, if you like, mass media 
And it, that's why things like this are so important. I think Falkland is doing a great thing here in encouraging us to go back to our own, well, what well, our own culture believed. I, well, well, it's said that, that the word, well, some use the word butcher. Butcher. That, mm -hmm. that word comes from the English word witch. So that indicates that there wasn't a Gaelic word for it. Or butcher. I wonder too, look, that, that sort of lineage of time, we know that the Christian church didn't discourage customs like burning a fire because it would have people would be, or, or, or gathering the Meiju or any of these things. Um, but they put a new significance on, this is, is pre-Reformation, long since, because they, they felt they would, they would never get through to people if you're gonna say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the next, you can't, etc. So they put a new light on it. And some of the old Catholic um, writings encourage um, the, not, to dis, not to criticize but to give a new meaning um, to mm -hmm. oh, well, there's a whole range of things, including bonfires. OK, Rhoda, you've been waiting patiently. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask Rusty, if, if Liz Truss is the witch, what are we calling <laughs> Boris? <laughs> what <one? laughs> <laughs> like, if she's a witch, I thought a long time ago there should be two rowan trees at the foot of the steps of 10 Downing Street. <laughs> Freya has got a question as well. She wants to know um, if you've got any examples of people turning into cats. Against the cats. Turning into cats. Well, they turned into a lot of things. Campbell, whom we mentioned, John Gregerson Campbell, he has a wee chapter in each one. The witch as a cat, the witch as a horse, the witch as a sheep, the witch as a gull, the witch as a whale, the witch as a whole string of them. The witch as a sheep, could you picture it? And then uh, witch, witchcraft and clay dolls. It, it's actually worth, a, it really is worth a read. Um, there are some books about witchcraft, I'm going to confess, I don't read them because I just sense this awful evil. Oh, <laughs> gee was I'm not reading that. And no, maybe I can't explain. But that one, the approach is very different. It's from light rather than darkness, if that makes any sense to you. So if I feel that the writer is describing what is, but he's not saying, you should believe in this, turn into a cat, etc. It's a very complex subject, isn't it? We've got time for one more question. Somebody madly, madly waving down here at the left. Um, we were 15 minutes late in starting, so I've given this a 15 minute run beyond our allocated, original allocated time. So I'm conscious that Roddy is now beginning probably to get a wee bit angsty thinking about the next session that's coming up, but you deserved your full quota. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for this rich retelling of these accounts across the aisle. Um, what I wondered, was curious about was the process of the retelling. So was it always the place, the ground, the craft, the house that was mentioned or described first when they were telling an account? Thanks, Cara. Did you get the question, Katrina? I, d I did, yeah. yeah. Um, you're asking when people, when people were telling um, of their encounters with witches or of their knowledge of witches, did, was it in relation to a place? No, I think it was very often in relation to, to the person. I think that's where the emphasis lay. Um, but you heard Rusty talking about Lurepost and he had quite a lot of stories in connection with Lurepost and these, these were sometimes they were pinned to a particular part of the village. But I think really in, in talking about, like when the School of Scottish Studies sent people out to ask about it, um, it was, they would ask about people's knowledge of their own village, but I don't think it was tied necessarily any more specifically than that to a place, and it was about the people who, what kind of people fell under suspicion, or indeed which specific people fell under suspicion. Margaret? Although a lot of witchcraft or witch stories are 
are, are rooted in place. I think of the Witch of Mooney, the Witch of Lors, the Witches, a whole lot of them. Or even the quarry that the uncle spoke of. Oh, don't go near that quarry, I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly where it is. I wouldn't go near it, even if you don't believe. It's that kind of fear of... And there's a few places in Quebec as well they avoided. Um, and this, that was the area settled by Lewis and Harris people and one or two from Uist. They just... Um, it's, it's, I think it's... Uh, Better not to tempt fate, either of the police or the person and so on, but, but, but to keep the consciousness alive through the person, maybe. Yes, I think that's, that's probably true. Um, and I think it probably, it sounds as though it differs from place to place, oh, yes. because I think certainly here it, it was very much, a, people had that intimate knowledge of their community and of their neighbours. So if you, if you hinted at somebody having the bushnyach, everybody would know. If you'd said too much today, if there are any lochies in the audience, I don't know if they get up this early, but if <laughs> there are any lochies in the audience, if you'd hinted too much about who you were talking about, they would have been probably able to identify well, them. That's why I kept quiet about one of my neighbours. I didn't want to mention. Oh, he died long ago, but I didn't want to mention. There was one of those who avoided a certain woman when he went fishing. I mean, <laughs> people alive today, relatives of that person, so I, of both of them. So I didn't want to mention anyone. You've got to be careful what you say. Mm -hmm. Okay, Harden. I think we've probably. Um, we haven't actually covered everything, or even a fraction of everything. But I think it, as far as a conversation between three people who are absolutely steeped in knowledge on the topic, we've really all been hugely informed and massively entertained, and you know, ed entertained in the, a very positive way that I want to use that word, and certainly for myself, much more educated than I came in. So thank you, all three of you.